Jordan, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing pretty good. How are you guys doing? Yeah, very well. It's uh, it's good to finally meet you. Be uh, watching your content for a while, mate. I've been looking forward to this conversation. So thanks <laughs> for making the time to, to come and chat to us. Yeah, I'm quite literally your target audience. I'm a I'm a blue belt. We've been doing it two years. So since I started, I've been watching watching your stuff pretty much. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys watching my content. So yeah, it's good, mate. Good content. And you have to bear with Danny today. He's got a little bit of a uh, jujitsu boo boo. <laughs> He, uh, he got himself a scratch. I just got infected and I've got like a Ming in hand that's like double the size now. <laughs> oh, no. Just got some antibiotics and bits and pieces. It's, uh... Did you say you had staff? Well, no, I've not really got staff. I, it's, it, was a, it was like a cut. And I think the cut, like from someone's fingernails, and I think it's just got, I don't know, infected really fast. But went to bed last night and it was like a bit achy. And I woke up this morning and my hand was double the size. So I was like, oh, <laughs> got to go to the doctor's. Well, it's probably staph because that's the way it works. Like if you have a cut and you get bacteria in it, it's usually either staph, I can't pronounce it, or it's like strep uh, bacteria. And then yeah. you get impetigo or you get staph. And yeah, it's, it's, uh, what, it's, what, it's something, isn't it? They couldn't really tell me up on the hospital, but they were just like, take these antibiotics. They, they, they hooked me up, put it through my veins straight away so it didn't get any worse. And then, yeah, just sent me on my way. Yeah, and there's one more thing to worry about too, like antibiotics. Like, <clears throat> obviously, it's better to take if you have like an infection, you should take it. But like, it's best to avoid them as much as possible because it wipes out your uh, gut bacteria and can put you in gut dysbiosis. Just yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree. I, I, I genuinely don't like taking any medication um, if I can avoid it. So I don't like taking even like paracetamol. So I said to Paul before this, I was like, it annoys me more that I just have to take antibiotics <laughs> just to get better. But, yeah, we'll dye your uh, dye your beard silver, mate, and you could be the UK's uh, answer to Gordon Ryan without the skill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Give me five years. Yeah, um, but mate, wanted to kick off um, and chat about the ultimate self defence championships that you were, of course, on recently. So that recently went out season two, and we recently released an episode with Rokus where we were talking about you know his idea and, and his perceptions of the show, and we've seen it. And obviously, you featured on that show. And wanted to kick off with uh, a question for those that haven't seen it. But would you pull guard in a knife fight? Of course, yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> I would, and uh, I did, and it worked out pretty good. And like, you know, so basically for those who haven't watched it yet, um, we did like a knife scenario where we had five rounds against a, like a, a knife attacker in a small space. And yeah, like uh, I was trying to think of what tactics i can use what strategy and i figured well if i keep my torso away from the knife uh that would be a good thing and pulling guard does exactly that i mean you use your feet and your legs to keep the person away from your torso but then you know you can get cut in the leg which isn't good but i'd rather get cut in the leg than you know get cut in my stomach and um yeah you know i i i was i knew that people would criticize that or at least like you know, I have something to say about it. So I thought that would be a really cool thing to do for that reason alone too. Like for a lot of reasons, one, let's see what, if this works. And then two, let's see what people say about it. So I can't wait to see people's um, reactions to it. Cause people always say, you know, you wouldn't pull a guard in, in a knife fight or a fight in general, but I mean, maybe we should reevaluate that. Maybe it's not a bad idea if you have a good guard. Yeah. I, I was so surprised. I was, cause I, I'm, I'm a dirty guard puller. So everyone gives me stick in my gym about it. But when you done that, I was like, see, it works. <laughs> but yeah, I was, uh, I was, am I was amazed. Like it, it was it at first seemed ludicrous and it almost seemed like it was a bit of a parody and you were, were taking the piss a little bit, but like you say, it was actually quite effective and your, your rationale for doing it actually did make sense. And I think there was obviously even one occasion where you managed to kick the knife out of the guy's hand from recollection. And yeah, uh, yeah you, you came out, you know, technically alive. And, and when you look at season one, I think the guys got absolutely obliterated in that season. So, so yeah, it was, uh, it was an interesting uh, way of defending yourself. Do you, do you feel like you could have went harder if it was a kind of a, you know, more real life situation? Yeah, like that's one thing I think that worked out not in my favor was not uh, going as hard as I could have. Like I was up kicking him pretty like pretty hard, but I wasn't going for the kill, you know, trying to knock him out or anything. Where like some competitors, um, they went a little bit harder, which I'm not criticizing. I think, you know, it made sense to do that. Like I wish I would have learned earlier on to to go a little bit harder. Like for example, Natan, his first challenge, he realized he's got to go harder because these guys... Um, they're told that when they get, you know, 
hurt, they're hurt and they're done. But like, it's, it's hard to self analyze like, okay, am I out or am I not? So I'm not blaming them either. But like, yeah, like he kind of realized he's got to go a little bit harder on them. He, he learned that from the first uh, challenge where it took me a couple challenges to realize I got to like put these guys out basically because just because I land a clean head kick uh, or up kick to someone's head, it doesn't mean that they're going to stop the fight. I thought they were going to. I was like, these are these are some like uh, clean shots to the head. They're going to stop it. It would have been a knockout. <laughs> but then, you know, they didn't. And we just kept going because I was trying to hit him <laughs> with the flat of my foot instead of my heel because I would have hit him with my heel. Then that would have been like really bad. But yeah, you know, I wish I would have knocked it the the knife out of his hand every single round too. I think that would have been really cool. But I didn't do it until the last round. Um, and yeah, like... You know, it, it was such a cool experience because I really realized, uh, you know, not that I didn't think I'd be effective. Uh, like I knew that knife fighting was dangerous and like not a good idea, but I really realized how much uh, of a risk it is, like, which, which again, sounds obvious, but like I would never want to get into a fight with someone that has a knife, um, which again, I wouldn't either either way, but I have like a newfound, newfound like respect for like uh, weapons and that whole thing because man, it's not easy to defend yourself against a knife. If someone has a knife, even if there's a huge skill gap, like they, they're probably going to stab you. Yeah, that's that's one thing I took away from just watching the two seasons so far. Is if if someone's got a knife, uh, I don't know. If I think I can outrun them, I might outrun them. But you, you you genuinely have zero chance, in my opinion, to not get hurt if they're really intent on hurting you. Um, and that's quite scary. Extremely. Yeah, yeah, it is, isn't it? Because you train and you think, oh, I'd be able to, I don't know, be able to outskill them in some way or whatever. But watching that self-defense, all you guys are like black belts and top, you know, karate guys and different martial arts. And some of them were experts in knife attacks and stuff like that. And they couldn't stop you, stop people, you know. And uh, that was just such an eye-opener to me. I, I, even, I even said that to my wife the other day. I was like, anyone ever like pose a knife, whatever, just give them what they want. <laughs> or run <laughs> i don't know what to say like yeah i mean like going into it i kind of thought you know i'll do this i'll grab the wrist i'll control them um i'll control the wrist i'm not gonna get stabbed i'll do kimura whatever it is and then when you're in the scenario it's like everything's going so fast and they're going and you can't do the things you imagine in your head it's like way harder so yeah like i imagine in, in the uk too like we don't have a lot of uh, knife problems here in canada but i hear so many things uh, in the uk because you guys don't have uh, guns yeah, it's all knife crime pretty much, especially in places like London, Manchester, Liverpool. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah. It's it's horrendous at the moment with knife crime. It's really, really bad. Yeah, and like the best people can, the best thing people can do is like train. Um, but it's sad that even that might not be enough to protect yourself, and even likely won't be enough against a knife. Yeah, and I guess uh, you could run away, but you'd need to remember your trainers, though, Jordan, huh? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was really frustrating. Yeah, because I forgot my shoes. And, you know, I thought we could just go back and get my shoes, like, because they were just at the Airbnb. But I didn't want to, you know, I want to be that guy, like, you know, you got to, like, wait for me and everything. But it wasn't a big deal. I did a barefoot and forgot, okay, I might need to actually run, is hide and go stab. And, you know, I might need to sprint, which I didn't have that in my head. I don't know. I thought, like, I would be fine. And then all of a sudden I'm sprinting. And then like my legs give out from underneath me because I'm sprinting downhill, which is not a good idea. Like, uh, yeah, I realized that you can't sprint downhill full force and not expect to fall. Yeah. If you, if you didn't stack it, I think he was getting away there, but I was, I, I was, I was in bed watching it and, uh, I had my headphones on and I just burst out laughing. Cause you hit the, you hit the deck so hard. I was like, Oh no, that was awful. <laughs> oh, it must've hurt. Did it hurt? It must've, it looked horrendous. Yeah, it's so much like adrenaline going that it wasn't too bad. Uh, like my hands were completely scraped up and they were worried I wouldn't be able to continue. But like, I'm not going to not continue. It's just my hands it wasn't a big deal. So it was funny because they were surprised that I didn't um, make a big deal out of it. it was, but I think that, yeah, I think people have made a big deal in past seasons about, you know, things and they've had some like uh, rough, I don't know. Tension, there's been some tension so like maybe that's why they were kind of worried but like yeah no i'm i knew i knew it'd be fine but like yeah it kind of felt it felt like a horror movie you know you see someone they fall and you're like oh my god what an idiot like the, you know, <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> like scream you yeah, remember exactly. scream one yeah and it seems like uh not like it's something that wouldn't happen but then you do it and it's like oh shit like it's actually very 
probable. Like I couldn't believe that I did that. Like I just felt as, as if it's a horror movie. And yeah, it was like a dream, like a terrible dream falling. And I was, but at least I won that round. So I'm, I was still happy. Yeah, it looked, uh, looked a bit painful, mate. And I was I was gutted for you. Like Danny said, it looked like you were doing really well. Yeah, he would have got away. If he didn't fall, he was gone. They weren't catching you, I didn't think. Yeah, it was quite hard to watch, I thought. Like, you were so close to getting away, and then you fell, and then you fell again, and then just got jumped on, and it was just like game over. I know. It's a good, it's a good idea, though, isn't it? Yeah. Some of those scenarios. Yeah, yeah. What did you uh, what did you make of Craig? Because he was obviously uh, a bit of a surprise watching it. And again, like your guard pod in the knife fight, a bit controversial because relatively untrained but just uh you know typical aussie bloke what did you make of him yeah craig he, first off he was a, just a great guy like a fun guy to hang around and um yeah you know he, he did really well which which surprised us all and kind of even uh not frustrated us well i guess it kind of did just because he was uh, ahead of me even for for a bit and ahead of the others too and we're like what the hell's going on here um but I think that some of the challenges were like like the the one challenge where it was like a memory challenge um we had to like you remember what you saw and everything that was the first challenge we did and that really messed with my head a little bit because i was ready to go i was ready to fight and then all of a sudden it's over i'm like what the hell was that i wasn't even paying attention and then that really screwed me but like craig did really well in that one and then um some of the other ones too that were less fighting um specific um, but he did well in the fighting ones too, but like winning that one and, and some of the other ones are doing well in that one really helped him a lot. Um, but yeah, like it was really cool to see him do well and, uh, Ranton too, like, uh, he, he did really well and he was just an awesome guy too, to, to hang out with, but you know, he's a white belt jitsu has like Kung Fu, uh, which he admits to isn't the most practical. He does some boxing, but I think he did very well I, like him and craig both imp impressed me a lot and beyond that it was just great to uh spend the week with these guys and get to know them become friends like yeah they're, they're great guys on the show yeah no they seemed it's only watching like craig seemed like a good a good crack and yeah just how pragmatic he was to, to some of the scenarios i just we, we talked when we spoke to rokas we we just kind of said that certainly in like the pub scene it was just obvious that he just spends time in that environment and he, he and he understands it and typically as a martial artist you sometimes live a particular lifestyle that may not incorporate pubs and i don't even know how common pubs are in the us anyway but you could tell he'd been in that environment before and probably been in those situations before just just watching him conduct himself yeah exactly where i feel like he had an advantage uh that way same with natan natan he, he told me he's been in uh fights with multiple attackers he's had knives pulled on him he's like been in these bar scenarios i've never been in any of these situations like i i've spent uh i don't know a minimal amount of time in bars like uh i was never like that like i've had my i've been with my wife i've been with my wife since i was 13 years old so i never had a reason to you know go to bars and whatnot so like the, all that was like completely foreign to me so like when they offered me water and i drank it i was the only one that drank <laughs> water you know because i'm just an idiot well it's not because i'm an idiot it's, it's more like i'm just ignorant of how uh that's not a smart thing to do because again i don't put i've never been in those situations so yeah i'm not complaining or but i think uh or saying i had a disadvantage but in some sense i did because i feel like a lot of these guys uh, craig particularly have more life experience in these scenarios than I did, which was a, a wake up call for me too, to, to understand that I don't know as much as I think I do. And um, even like situational awareness is something I need to work on. And just because I have the skills doesn't mean that, uh, you know, I can use them or effectively if, if in the wrong situations, I'm doing dumb things like drinking spiked water, right? I can't fight if I'm gonna be unconscious. So that was a great uh, wake up call for me. I gotta be smarter. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's easily done though, mate. If you if you're not in, not used to an environment, it's easy to make those mistakes, isn't it? I think. Yeah. And and how did you get on with the? Uh, you obviously said that the guys were great, great fun, but there was maybe a bit of a competitive edge with you and Natan, maybe. Like how how was that behind the scenes? Yeah, that was uh, tense, <laughs> but like in a good way. So it was mostly my fault because I mean, uh, before we started filming, I told everyone that I'm going to win the season, and. Uh, which just may automatically makes things tense, like right, because he's a gamer <laughs> too, right? He wants to win too, and I didn't say it like cockily, like um, I don't know that's the right word, but um, you know, I just stated my intentions, like I'm a competitor, I'm not going to go there to lose or or not, or not win. Like I was, my eyes were set on the prize, I'm going to win this, and I thought that would be a good. Um, 
way to make it more exciting and more drama just by outright saying that. Um, and I think that fired up Natan and especially probably because he saw me um, do well in hiding, go, in hiding, go stab too. And how like much I wanted it. Um, and that motivated him. He's like, no more Mr. Nice Guy. And he's going <laughs> to, you know, yeah, he did try to like get in my head and whatnot. Um, and it was a good, it was smart because like, yeah, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it was a, it was a good time. Like we don't, we don't have any bad blood at all. Like I think we respect each other quite a bit. And I think that that tension just made for a great season and made for a great experience for everyone, even though it was kind of uh, super tense at times. Um, yeah. It, it, but like afterwards, it was like, I'm glad that it went like this. Yeah, no, it, it, was, it was it was good TV, mate. I definitely enjoyed it. It was really good. Yeah, it come through on the TV, though. That was a bit of tension there, didn't it? Yeah. It was, a, it was uh, yeah. yeah, it was fun to watch as it was unfolding. Yeah, I remember when Natan talked about like what you were saying a moment ago, where he was like, "Right, I need to like up my game a little bit here." And uh, yeah, and, and I think it was during the stab in the, the, the shank tank when he did the spinning back kick oh, on no. that poor guy. I was like, Jesus, I don't know, he didn't break his ribs. That was, hard, that was an unreal kick. Really. Yeah. So yeah, he was going in hard for sure. Well, that was a bit of my worry. Um, was just that, like. I saw how hard everyone was going on the people and like, I'm down to fight and everything, but, um, I was worried that it would get too competitive uh, and we would like truly just go at it. Um, but I didn't end up getting to fight either way, but, uh, cause I hurt my knee, but yeah, that was like a, a worry for some of us for a bit. Like how hard are we going to go on each other? Because the first season, like they went hard for sure. And that, that was like what I was expecting, but, I think that it ended up being a little more intense and a little harder than the first season. And it was like, okay, are we going to fight each other that hard too? Like that was a discussion we had to have, like, because some of those shots were like going for the kill. Yeah, no, it was an interesting one. And, and I, I appreciated the fact that you attempted to not use your mixed martial arts skills, but kind of focus more on using just jujitsu to, to kind of almost battle test that to some degree. So I guess that, that begs the question, you know, do you feel that jujitsu as a standalone martial art does act as a good tool for self-defense in most of those scenarios? I think it is. And I thought that going into it, um, but I also thought going into it, and I still think this, that you never want to leave anything. Um, you never want like. I don't, I don't think it makes sense to be a good grappler. And if that, if your focus is self-defense and not be a good striker too, like mm. you, know, you should have all bases covered. If self-defense is what you care about, like you should be training wrestling, Muay Thai, Jiu-Jitsu, like everything you can to be good at fighting. If that's what you want to do, because grappling is only one half of fighting, um, which is an important half, but yeah, I wouldn't want to put myself in a situation where I didn't have the other half when I needed it. Um, so, you know, cause you can't always dictate where the fight goes. And I think that's something that grapplers sometimes, uh, overestimate is their, uh, you know, ability to use their jujitsu without any striking in a, in, in a, in a fight. Like a lot of grapplers, if they were to just go to one MMA sparring session, they would see, holy shit. Like I need to work. Uh, I need a lot of, I got, I have a lot of work to do if I want to use this in a fight, because man, like, um, that happened to me, my first MMA session, it's like, it's hard to take these people down when they're trying to punch me. And if I, if I end up on the bottom, they can punch me and that's not good. So, um, I learned real quick, uh, how to adjust my grappling, uh, when strikes are involved because of necessity, where if you find that out in a real fight, that's not, that's not a good place to find that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, it is very true. And years ago, I, I've done a bit of MMA and I had a friend who was uh, an MMA competitor and, and, and was really good at an amateur level, but his base was jiu-jitsu and his, his striking was not bad and his wrestling was like mediocre, but a very strong jiu-jitsu base. And I remember he, his first pro fight come against a really strong wrestler who had good tie boxing. And it was one of the, the worst things I've ever seen, seeing my, my friend get absolutely destroyed because he could not take this guy down and he was just a sitting duck because he didn't have the hands to match with this guy. And he obviously in a street fight with no rules and, and nobody to stop that fight, it could have been far worse. So, so yeah, I think that's really good advice, mate. Yeah. And in a street fight, you don't know uh, like what size the person's going to be either. And uh, like, it might be even harder taking them down. And uh, yeah, just, just in general, the worst matchup for a grappler is a wrestler that can strike. If, if you can't take them down and they can strike you, you are screwed. So, 
like, you know, when I started uh, MMA, I, I wanted to get good at Muay Thai and like, not just like good enough. Like I wanted to get good at Muay Thai. I wanted to be the best at Muay Thai, best at boxing, you know, t- along with my jujitsu, like, um, where I feel like a lot of MMA fighters, if they're like good at jujitsu, they're like, Oh, I'll just train striking just enough or vice versa too. I'm a good striker. I'll just train jujitsu here and there. But it's like, no, if you want to be the best, um, you got to be the best in every area. And if you're going to fight, You should be the best in every area because if you're not, you're going to get yourself hurt. And if you're going to get hurt, just don't do it. So like my advice for people in MMA is don't fight unless you're going to be the best. If you can't be the best, don't fight. Yeah, do not fight. Like don't risk your brain cells. Yeah, I agree. I agree massively. Um, Obviously in the show, you, as you said, you you had to pull out sadly because of injury. And that was something that I wanted to talk to you about as well. Obviously you had, I think it was an injured knee at the time and that was uh, an ongoing or reoccurring problem that you had. And I think I, I heard you talking recently on your own podcast um, where you were having a discussion around the fact that you're having to adapt your training now um, because of injuries. And, you know, I've been doing this a little while. I'm the wrong side of 40 and I'm finding that I'm having to adapt my jujitsu to accommodate my injuries and my, my you know, diminishing body. Like talk, talk us about that injury and, and how you've kind of, how you're managing your injuries and how you're adapting your training at the moment. Yeah. So uh, I think, uh, six months before the filming, I hurt my knee. I it's either my meniscus or it could possibly be my ACL, which I'm really hoping it's not. I need an MRI on it, but basically it feels mostly fine until it like slips it. Like uh, if I put too much weight on it, if I push off the mat or the floor too hard, it like, it's like my bones slip, which apparently that's like more like ACL, but yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah. But it's weird because like I have really good stability, um, unless it slips, which you know it's only slipped like um, I don't know, it's probably slipped like six times since uh, I heard it, which is a, a good amount of time. It's not good, but I mean, when it's not slipped, it feels fine. So like, I don't know. It's weird if I do have a torn ACL. It's just weird that I can be fine unless it actually slips. So yeah, but I guess you've got to have good muscular control as a result of your conditioning, which will stabilize the knee to a point. But then obviously in certain scenarios, or if you're maybe focusing your control elsewhere then obviously the body will rely on the ligament. And if it's not there, then you're probably going to see that slippage, mate. So it does sound like it. Touch wood, I hope it's not. But um, yeah, you might want to get that checked out. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm so dumb. Like uh, I had an MRI appointment and I went to the wrong hospital for it. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't, I don't know. I didn't read it, uh, the sheet good enough. So I got to get another MRI appointment. But yeah, probably ACL or meniscus. But either way, it's not a huge deal because Mm. um, yeah, like I'm lucky where I'm just naturally have like really, Uh, muscular legs so like i think they carry the weight of it pretty well um but yeah i've been adjusting my training pretty good because my neck is just super messed up too and um yeah just in general i feel like my body is so stiff now um now that i'm like 33 almost 34 where i never felt like this before like yesterday i was rolling with uh like a blue belt or white belt and i had them put me like because i mess around i let them put me in an arm bar and like i was holding my grips together and when he was trying to pull it out it was it was just putting so much pressure on my shoulder. Like, uh, like my shoulder couldn't take it. And I decided to tap before, before I even, it wasn't even, like, I wasn't tapping to the arm bar. It was like tapping him, try to pull my arm straight. Um, so I was like, like last night I was thinking, Oh shit, I really got to get my shoulder mobility like better because like this, this isn't like good. Like this isn't how ha- I shouldn't be tapping to like shoulder pain. Um, yeah. So, but yeah, I've been like adjusting my training overall and just, uh, yeah, like I'm trying not to do double legs anymore too much because I keep spiking my head on people. Um, and then my neck hurts for a while and just, yeah, I'm just realizing more and more that I need, I need to take care of my body. Um, yeah, as I'm getting older, it sucks, but it's the way she goes. But I don't know. I feel like, uh, with, with what I know now and how I take care of my body now, I should be good to go for like ever now because I can. I'm, I'm pretty confident in my ability to protect myself now. It's like a lot of my injuries are from being dumb in the past, but now I'm smarter. Yeah, I think I've, I've definitely, I'm 34, 35 next month, and I've only been doing it for a few years, but you do get those niggles, don't you? Your shoulders and your, and your lower back and a few bits and pieces in your neck. But one thing, speaking to um, Cameron Shane from, uh, was it Budokun University? He, um, he talked about longevity on the mats, and since talking to him, I do probably and not not loads, but maybe like three sessions of thirty minutes, forty five minutes of stretching and mobility work, and that's that's genuinely changed everything for me. Like my shoulders, I make sure I get the bands out. I, I do it all properly, and I make sure I do that three times a week. And since I've been doing that for the last maybe like 
five months. It's seen such a huge difference in just not getting as injured or not feeling those niggles anymore. Yeah, I believe it because like, um, and that's what I've been trying to start implementing. I'm just uh, been kind of lazy getting that uh, big building that habit, but it's boring, isn't it? That's yeah. a problem. It's boring. <laughs> uh, in, in my in my uh, thing, I'm paid twice a week to do stretch work with one of my clients, so it's it's kind of good. I get paid to then do kind of my own stretches as well. It's nice. That's <laughs> ideal. Yeah. No. Like yeah. I, I see it forces me. I see on TikTok all the time like guys that are super flexible doing like super cool things. And I think like the chances of you getting hurt in jiu-jitsu are pretty low if you can bend your body that way. So I see the benefit of uh, using mobility. I just need to actually do it. But yeah, it's, I think it's definitely a game changer. And does it change your kind of your, your perspective of jujitsu? And I also heard you talking recently about how you, you kind of are obviously full time in jujitsu between coaching and teaching and YouTube. And you kind of almost miss doing other things. Like when these injuries start to accumulate, does it ever make you sort of question like what you're doing here with jujitsu? Um, not, not really. Uh, not the injuries so much. It's yeah, it's just, I, I don't think the injuries kind of get me feeling that way. It's more so just, um, yeah, just uh, curiosity of like what else is out there. Like what else? Cause jiu-jitsu is fun, but there's other things that are fun too. And just like basing my whole life around, around jiu-jitsu for the last like 13 years, has just, uh, it's been a lot of jiu-jitsu. So, you know, sometimes I want to do other things, but I'm so tied to this. It's, you know, it's good to have your passion be your job, but then, then also your job is your passion and it's like, it's a job. So like, um, it's not ideal always, but yeah, it's better than like a real job. So I can't, I can't complain. <laughs> it's really interesting. You said that we had, um, a guy called Backpacker Ben on recently, and he's in the same sort of situation where he's really passionate about traveling. Started a YouTube channel, got quite big, kind of similar sort of uh, size to your YouTube channel. And now he's in that cycle of like, he can't stop traveling because it's his income and it's his hobby. But now he's in that cycle of he can't stop, but he kind of wants to try something else, but he doesn't know how to because it's money. It's not a bad life, but at the same time, there's other things out there. It must be, it must be, um, yeah, a bit of a bit of a problem at times if you don't actually want to put out some jujitsu content and you want to maybe try some other stuff. Yeah, exactly. Like <clears throat> I like jujitsu, but I don't want to do. Yeah, it just like every day it just becomes a lot. So I can see I can see how that'd be hard for him too. Like travel, it's just like. But then yeah, you just have no choice. Like you got to make money for your family, and you got to do what you got to do. But um, yeah, I would like. I just need more. Uh, what's the word? Uh, I don't know, variety in my life, I guess. And that's kind of my fault too. I just, yeah, I spend too much time thinking about jujitsu and um, yeah, making content and stuff like that. Yeah, usually done though, mate. Tell us about your jujitsu journey, Jordan, because I, I, like I said, we've been watching your content, but I, and you may have talked about this, you certainly probably have, but I've never seen like you talking about where you started. So I'm assuming you would have been around 20 when you started jujitsu, if it's been 13 years or so. Well, tell us about that first kind of that first session, if you can think that far back in jujitsu, and then your journey through to teaching in black belt. Yeah, so I started. Yeah, I was twenty one, and uh, I started in a small town. My first class was only four people, including me. So it was very uh, not like it is now, where my gym, like last night, it was twenty five people at Nogi. The night before that, in Gi, it was like over thirty people, and um, so it's just changed so much since I started. Uh, it, was, it was way more grassroots before. So it was, it was like four people. I started because I wanted to uh, fight MMA, but there's only a jiu-jitsu gym there uh, where I live because I live in a small town. So I started jiu-jitsu instead and I just loved it right away. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it wasn't the best gym for me. Um, like it was kind of uh, culty and like, you know, kind of the weird things like you hear about because um, it was very old school. So that's why I talk about old school, like the stuff I hate in jiu-jitsu. It's like all stuff I experienced in my first gym um that i went to so like yeah, a lot of stuff i say is mostly just like talking shit about my experience um because it was a negative experience overall um and uh yeah it's, and then so i i left there after i got my blue belts i started training at the town uh a, well, a couple towns over like a half hour drive and then uh crossfit gym i was like going to, i was going to crossfit they asked me if i want to start a grappling program uh there i was like well shit like i'm only a blue belt uh, but I do want to start a gym. It's just not the best timing, but I didn't want to say no either. So I did it. Got a lot of criticism from people in the community. They're like, oh, you can't start a gym as a blue belt. 
Um, well, I did, and you know things are going fine now. So uh, yeah, yeah, and I'm glad I did too. So I've got a lot of people to grapple with and you know established gym. So if I would have waited till I was a brown or black belt, I'd have less people to train with, and I had a great time too. Like, and I was, I was confident in my ability to teach too because I've been competing and training. Like I was all in on, on jiu-jitsu. I was obsessed with it. I was competing like every uh, like every other week and winning basically all my matches since I was doing well. So it was just, it was funny to me, someone telling me I can't, uh, I can't open up a gym. I can't teach like why, like, uh, I I'm pretty good at jujitsu. Like doesn't, the belt doesn't really matter to me. And I, it still doesn't matter to me. Like, uh, it's cool being a black belt, I guess, but I don't go out of my way to tell people I'm, I'm a black belt because it doesn't really matter because there's black belts that suck and there's blue belts that are really good. It's just like, to me, the belts are just, uh, they're a good indication, but they're not like, uh, yeah, they're not that important. So yeah, back then as a blue belt, I had more skill than a lot of um, black belts. You know, I was beating black belts and I was rolling with them. You know, you can't say beating, but because it's in the gym, but like, that's just reality. So I knew I, I knew I was fine. But yeah, you know, people, they, they weren't happy with it, but screw what they think. Yeah, so it's a funny one, isn't it? That because I, I started in the UK probably first about 18 years ago and I was training under a blue belt. And I think there's occasions where you just learn together, right? So, you know, you, you kind of bring in a team, you, you kind of bring in people to do jujitsu with, you share your knowledge and you learn together and, and grow together. And like you say, it, you know, ultimately the, the output is, is what it really comes down to. Tell us about some of the, um, the, 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 the things you experienced in that first gym, because we've had a, we've had a couple of funny conversations with various people about this stuff. And it's, I always find it quite funny to hear because obviously time is moving on, but you still do get it around. Tell us about some of those things that you found quite annoying about the old school jiu-jitsu gym. Uh, well, the first thing I, I absolutely hated was uh, classes were two hours long and it was an hour and 45 minutes of, of technique. And that, that's like a seminar, right? So, and that was, it was like doing a seminar three days a week because there's only three, three classes, but it was like doing a seminar three classes a week and then only rolling for 15, 20 minutes. And like, this is like not what I want. Um, so I would go to open mats, you know, the town's over and everything. And he told me, you can't do that. You got to, uh, you got to, you know, use your training partners. You got to, it's like disrespectful to them to like go to open mats, other places that, you know, aren't even, uh, that are open days that my gym wasn't open. Like I didn't understand why that would be a problem. So when he told me that, I was like, well, I'm a grown man. Like I can, I can do what I want. Like I, you can't tell me I can't go train with my friends. That's stupid. Um, yeah. So that's one thing I hated. Um, and just, you know, dumb things like the guy would like rough you up like crazy. He's a big guy. He's pretty good too. And he would just hurt you. Like, you know, I don't, you don't need to uh, crank my shit and just put, and just make me super uh, uncomfortable and in pain when you're like 50, 60 pounds heavier than me, way better than me. And like, I would just leave class like uh, my, like one class in particular, my face is all red and busted up. Like my elbow was so sore because he just cranked the arm bars so hard. I was like, shit, what am I doing to myself? Like, um, this, this is not good for my body. And, uh, it, after that class, I was like, I'm not coming back. And, um, yeah, he was like super pissed when I left and, uh, has like talked shit about me ever since and hated me ever since. So like, <laughs> it's like a mirror. <laughs> yeah. This is super common. This kind of crap. It, it happens everywhere. I, I come from uh, football and you could probably call it soccer, but I, I find it crazy coming into jujitsu and all this cultish weird behavior. I, I, can't, I still can't get my head around it. I'm like, I don't understand why you can't train where you want, you know, go in, enjoy the session at your regular gym. But if you want to go in and train with your friends at a different gym, just go and train. It's not a big deal. We all like jujitsu. That's my biggest take from it you know we're not against each other we're kind of we're a small community as it is we're not you know it's not a huge sport um why can't we all just get along and just and just train together i just never understand that side of stuff exactly i think sometimes if you're not letting people go train elsewhere or you're roughing up your sort of smaller less experienced students then uh for me there's a maybe a confidence a question mark of a confidence there or or self-esteem i don't know yeah dick size problem yeah <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So I like that. Um, you know, I'm sure his students watch my YouTube channel. I'm sure when he goes on YouTube, he sees my video or whatever, and it probably pisses him off. So it makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously you did a little bit of MMA as well. And you were uh, an amateur champion, I think. I think you had, a, did you have an undefeated amateur record? Yeah, I went 5-0 and in MMA, 2-0 uh, and in Muay Thai. Uh, I finished all my 
my MMA fights by submission. I finished both my Muay Thai fights by TKO. So I had a pretty successful amateur career. Um, but then what happened was uh, right right as I was gonna as I was gonna go pro, uh, my wife got pregnant with twins, and it's like okay, well this is a pain in the butt, um, but I'm still gonna do it. I'm still gonna I'm gonna go pro, and then the pandemic hit. I'm like, God damn it! Now there's like another uh, obstacle in the way. And then just uh, during the pandemic, I started my YouTube channel and uh, realized I should just put my time and energy into this because it's, you know, it makes me money where MMA, it's not going to make me much money and it's going to hurt my brain. So yeah, I just basically retired from MMA, but, uh, yeah, my amateur career went really well. Um, yeah, I can't complain for sure. Won, won all my fights by finish. And how about your, uh, your jujitsu competition record? You mentioned that you did well competing earlier. Is, is that still something that you aspire to do at a higher level or are you quite content just teaching, doing YouTube? Yeah, I'm just content teaching and doing YouTube. Like, uh, it just takes a lot of energy and commitment, and everything to compete, which I don't have. Like, I don't have that energy or desire. And um, yeah, like, it's just not like I did it for so long. It's just not something I want to do nowadays. And, and because it's not great for your body either. Like, uh, that's when you. I think. I think tournaments are the highest risk in terms of hurting yourself. And that's just not what I want to do. Like, like longevity is so important to me. I just want to train. So like, why, it doesn't make sense to me to put myself in situations where I'm going to be stressed. I'm going to potentially hurt myself. I'm going to be like, uh, focusing on that instead of other things that are also important. So sometimes I, I get the feeling like people think I'm scared or something to lose, especially, uh, like black belts, like kind of local, like, uh, where I live in Ontario, Canada, like, I just get this feeling that they're like, Oh, you know, he's scared or whatever, but maybe I'm wrong. And I'm just like paranoid kind of thinking what they're thinking, but I just, the impression I've gotten. And yeah, I'm not like scared to compete, like, um, comp competed for a long time. And I, I always did well. Um, like, uh, yeah, I was, I'm very happy and confident with my uh, competition uh, record as a, in, in jiu-jitsu. Yeah, I've competed, I've competed at all belts and, and done well at all belts. Yeah. And then what's your thoughts on, because obviously you have competed and now you've kind of weighed it up. You've got a family, you've got another another business and it just, the risk reward obviously isn't there for you right now, nor is probably the, the time in the day, right? But you have competed, so you've obviously got that experience. I mean, when you think about your students and, you know, sort of advising their progression, do you do you think competing is, you know, a, a, a good part of the journey to have? Or do you think ultimately it doesn't matter if you've competed or not by the time you get to Black Belt in 10 years? Yeah, it doesn't matter at all, I think. Like, I don't think it factors in even a little bit. Like, I think people, they over, um, yeah, they they overemphasize the importance of competing. Like it, it can do good things. Like it can help you get better jujitsu. It's a good life experience. Cause you know, it, not many times in your life can you feel that rush of competing in jujitsu or combat sport in general, but like it, someone that doesn't want to compete. Um, yeah, I don't think they, anyone should ever be encouraged to do something like combat sport that they don't really want to do, um, competitively, where I think that a lot of coaches put pressure on their students to compete, um, which isn't as bad in, in jiu-jitsu. It's like worse in Muay Thai and MMA. Like, um, if they don't want to fight, they don't want to fight. Like, but in jiu-jitsu, it's not as bad, but it is bad at the same time. I think like if they don't want to do it, they don't want to do it. So yeah, I don't think it. I don't think that it's a big deal. If someone doesn't ever want to compete. Like they, they, they if they're good at jiu-jitsu, then they're good at jiu-jitsu. Yeah. No, it's something that we've, we've talked about because I, I competed, you know, probably going back 10 years ago and I've toyed with the idea about having competed for a while and, and don't really want to. As Danny said, he's still relatively new in the grand scheme of things. And we've talked about whether we want to compete or not. But again, it's like the risk reward. There's other things that we're focused on right now and putting ourselves, you know, in the, you know, increased risk for, for a bit of tin, a bit of metal. Yeah. I, don't, I just don't know if it's worth it. That's my biggest thing is like, I'm, I'm, I'm really busy family trying to do a lot of stuff on YouTube and we're trying to push forward. And, you know, the worst thing that could happen to me at the moment is, is I, really you know i dislocate my shoulder i break my arm break my leg if i'd done that at the moment that would financially kind of ruin me um and it's not that i don't want to compete because i do it's like it's like this double-edged sword for me it's like i'm 34 35 i'm not really you know really what am i going to get out of it that's my biggest thing it's like what am i going to get out of it well i get a little meadow saying that i'm you know i don't know local champion and at blue belt at 90 kilos <laughs> no one cares <laughs> do you know what i mean it just doesn't really matter and it doesn't I, I think my biggest problem it doesn't matter enough to me it doesn't matter enough to me it doesn't prove anything to me 
Yeah, I mean, that's how I feel too. It's like a good uh, comparison. It's <clears throat> like I played soccer, like football, you guys call it. Like I played a, a, in a rec league, uh, just recreational league this summer. And um, like, I'm all right though. I'm pretty good. Like I used to, uh, I used to uh, play like competitively. Um, and I could, I could play like somewhat competitively now. Like I could go like the higher uh, league, but I just wanted to play recreational because that's all I want to do in my life. Like I just want to have a good time playing soccer right but it's the same thing with jiu-jitsu i i just want to have a good time training i don't want that stress of uh you know trying to beat this guy and him trying to beat me like i just that's not what i want i just want recreational so i think that it's almost like the, they should be separated because people combine them too much of like if you do jiu-jitsu yeah you should just compete it makes sense but like other sports it's totally fine if you don't want to compete like no one even bats an eye like it's just normal not to compete um you know like yeah soccer for example like your rec league is no one's saying hey you should be going you know in the competitive league like uh go compete there like where they take it much more serious right if you want to have a recreational game you can it's fine you just join the rec league so that's what jiu-jitsu is it can be too but yeah it's like the rec recreational people and the competitors get grouped into the same kind of category too much where they are separate and that's fine yeah, I think as well, because I played competitive, a fairly all right standard of football for so long, you know, from such a young age, like 16, I was playing with men and done that up until I was like 30. It feels like I just, I just, I've done, I've done it. I've done like that competitive, like, you know, I had to kind of eat, sleep and breathe football for so long. I was just like, I'm, I'm kind of just enjoying training. I enjoy jujitsu yeah. and I kind of don't want to ruin that. But then you know, football really killed it for me in the end because of the injuries. And I don't want that to happen then with jiu-jitsu. Because if I start getting injuries, even from that last comp that we done, I done, I done well, got my blue belt, it was all good. But then I come away and I was injured for nearly two months with a shoulder injury. And I'm just like, is it worth that, you know? Yeah, possibly not. Yeah, I find with me, I, uh, like yourself, I did uh, not, not quite as much as you and, and as well probably, but I did a little bit of MMA and uh, I trained MMA for years, boxed and, and did some striking sports before mm -hmm. that and competed in those things. And I don't know, for me, I always found that jujitsu was almost like a form of therapy. It was the, it was the one art that I just really enjoyed and found quite relaxed. And when I've competed, I've not done as well at jujitsu as I did with uh, the sort of mixed or striking sports. And part of it is because I, it's, it feels like they're trying to, it feels like they're upsetting my like peace like when I'm competing in jiu-jitsu, it shouldn't feel that stressful. And I don't like it and I just don't really enjoy the environment. Yeah, exactly. Man, it stresses me out so much. Every single tournament I've ever had, like I've been super stressed, super anxious, and I don't want to go through that again, <laughs> like whatsoever. So yeah, I, I yeah, I agree with you guys. Like, yeah, just people don't want to compete. It's fine. And yeah. yeah. So uh, we'll focus on YouTube then. So tell us about that, Jordan. Obviously, you started that in the pandemic, you said. So that's been, you know, three, four years. And obviously, your channel is, is doing very well. And we're talking to you now as a result of the content you put out, which uh, we've both watched and enjoy a lot. So tell us where that, that idea came from when you started that. What was the plan with it? Yeah, like I've been wanting to do a YouTube channel for a long time. I, um, I thought that'd be pretty cool. But in my mind, the market was oversaturated and um, there'd be no point of of like of trying to be successful and then one of my friends told me they're like no that's like the wrong mentality like um like you're the niche like people subscribe to you they want to learn from you the way you teach um and there's room for everyone because everyone has their own specific style of teaching and all that so which i realize more and more um now that like it's because sometimes people think that it's oversaturated now but it's not like it good content will do well. If you make good content, people are going to watch it. It doesn't matter how much other good content there is too. You make good content, yours will do well too. So mm. yeah, when I had that mindset shift, was, uh, that helped a lot. It's like, I'm going to go all in on this. And um, yeah, I knew it'd be successful. Like I, I remember I was, I told my, my wife, I'm like, I'm going to write, like I, I'm, when I announced I'm starting a YouTube channel, I'm like, I'm going to write, I'm going to have over a hundred thousand subscribers in like within a year or whatever. And she's like, no, don't write that. It's cocky. Um, but then I did, I'm like, shit, I wish I would have wrote that. Cause then, then, um, yeah, and I can look back and say, I did what I said I was going to do, but yeah, I knew it was going to be successful because I didn't give it any other option. Like, um, you know, I, I bought $10,000 worth of equipment, which I didn't have, like I bought it on my credit card. Like the pandemic was very hard on us financially. So like I didn't have any money, but I bought it on the credit card. And then I was like, I'm, this is like burning the ships. Like I'm going to go all in. I'm going to make this successful. I'm going to get my money back. And I'm going to, um, 
yeah, do well. And that's exactly what happened. Like I just didn't, uh, like every video, every video I did, I just wanted to make better than the last one. So, and I, w I wouldn't take like, I wouldn't take no for an answer. Like, I wouldn't take lack of success as an answer. So I just kept making it better and better and better. And eventually like one video did well. And then it like all the other ones started doing well too. And it's just like, ever since that one video did well, they just, it's just been, a um, yeah, the whole channel has been doing well. So, you know, I, I just kept going, going, going. I didn't give up on myself and yeah, it, went, it turned out really good. Yeah, that's amazing, mate. You, you did. You got to a hundred k subs in a year. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> that's a dream, mate. That. Which uh, which video was it that um, that kind of kicked off and, and and got the sort of ball rolling for you? Yeah, it was just a rolling commentary with uh, a big guy, and people just love the big guy roles. Like they like to see someone smaller uh, beat, beat someone bigger. So like whenever I roll the big guy, I always know that's going to do well. Um, uh, in the algorithm well a couple times it hasn't done well but usually it does really well so yeah it was like a blue belt power lifter and i posted it on reddit and then reddit actually liked it i was like what the hell usually reddit you know <laughs> yeah, so uh negative i'm like holy crap reddit likes it and then once once they were watching it saying it was good it like took off on the algorithm on youtube and then people are saying yeah good things so i was like shit like i have something here like i know that uh it's just going to continue it's just like I felt like when that happened, uh, when it started going crazy in the algorithm, I'm like, I made it. Like I know, uh, like I know what I need to do to, you know, keep going. Like I made, I figured out the content, uh, like the type of content people like, and I, I can make content like this for years to come. So, yeah, that was really, uh, yeah, that was a good time. Like seeing all the subscribers come in. Like I would look at, my, I would refresh my phone. There'd be like ten more subscribers. I refresh again. There's like ten more, more comments. It just went crazy for a couple months and then um like that didn't die down but like it, it wasn't as great like yeah it, it just started not going as much of a slope like it was just a, a crazy initial like um yeah a gain of like followers everything like that yeah and which which content do you enjoy creating the most is it is it those narrations or is it a different sort um I like I, I like like putting together a story like editing um, like challenge videos and prank videos stuff like that because it's more like creative when you're putting it together and I really I find that really fun. Um, the, I like I like doing the rolling commentaries usually. Sometimes like I'll be honest, sometimes they're boring boring for me, but I just need to get content out and that's just reality of being a content creator. And sometimes people would think that like oh that's like a bad thing to admit or something like you know you got to be passionate about everything, but. It's just not reality. So some some mm. some roles, I thought like oh, it's not the most interesting role, but I need to get a video out, or um, you know, I, won't, I can't meet my sponsor requirement. So not always do I love doing those, um, but when they're like exciting roles, then then I then I'm excited to do them and you know show everyone all the cool moves and everything. Um, and yeah, some content takes forever to make. Like uh, did like a Dars. Uh, a guillotine and anaconda guide and it was like 18 no 16 minutes long but it took me like 40 hours 50 hours to make i'm like holy shit this, this took way too long um i never want to make a something that takes that long again that's how i felt um and i don't i don't think i have made something that's that long uh since but i'm i think i'm due for it so i should do it again but yeah i, I like variety if i do like the same thing over and over it gets really boring for me and the audience so um but it's hard to think of content uh, especially doing it for years now like um stuff i haven't done but yeah yeah like i, I manage either way yeah mate and, and and to be fair it's not just you can tell like the the quality that you put in the effort you put in in the quality because obviously the substance is there in regard to your coaching points and your teaching ability but it actually looks really good as well so yeah, I think you're doing a great job, mate. And obviously, it shows in your subs. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, like aesthetics and like just the way things look are always like really important to me. Like, uh, yeah, I, I I like the way the videos look too. Like when I when I bought the camera, I didn't even know like what I was doing. Like I just got lucky <laughs> that like I bought like the most expensive camera, most expensive lens I could get. Like, I didn't really research them very much, and they just happened to be like beautiful looking. Um, like. I, when I saw the first time, like the video, I'm like, oh my God, this is like insane. It's like, it looks so beautiful. So, um, yeah. And a lot of people have said the same thing. They, they like, they like watching that when, you know, I, that's the way I approached it. Like I knew I would stand out if I had really good quality and, um, 
So like that investment of 10 grand was uh, more than worth it because I'm still using the exact same camera and it's, and it just keeps looking better and better and better as I figure out how to actually use it. Yeah, no, it's good, man. You, you mentioned about pranks as well. I think one of your more popular videos was the, uh, the, the, the fake white belt prank, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And uh, mate, <laughs> have you seen that? So yeah, funny. Yeah, I've watched it. Yeah, it's really good. Because it just, it just, it just, it just, it just tests obviously the egos of the students, and they, they, they were great to be fair. But that's just soul destroying, isn't it? For a lot of like blue and purple belts just getting filled in by the white. You belt. can see the purple belts hated at the most, can you? Because yeah. when you get a purple, you think you know you should be able to smash every blue belt, but or every white belt, you know, and in, in, in most of the blue belts, you know, and to get to that point and then be absolutely trashed by some white belt who's claiming he's just come in. I think I'd be the same. I'd be crying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And obviously you started the podcast as well. Is, how long have you been going with the, the podcast now for? Um, Like two years. But uh, yeah, recent, like today, actually, I just talked to the guys and decided uh, not to go, not to do it anymore, just to cancel. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah, it's over now. <laughs> so <I'm, laughs> we shouldn't ask now. What, what, what's your reasons? You just uh, You just kind of not got the time for it anymore? Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. Um, one would be, yeah, time where I just feel like it's probably better to use my time, uh, elsewhere. Like, um, just because I always feel like the podcast like takes the whole day away from me just because like I need to research what I want, what we're going to talk about. And it's also like kind of draining on me too. Like, uh, I gotta, I gotta try to be more energetic at least. And, um, which I'm not great at being, but, um, yeah, like, and just other things too. I don't know. Yeah. I can't get into it too much, but it just seems, it just, it, it was more more fun before. Yeah, that's fair enough, mate. Jordan, I know you've got to go in a second, mate, but um, do you want to give your kind of channels a shout out or sponsor a shout out or anything before you drop off? Not really. All right. Well, people know <laughs> where to find you. <laughs> mate, listen, uh, appreciate your time, mate. It's, it's great to meet you and hope to uh, have a conversation again at some point. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks thanks for having me. It was a, it was a good time. Yeah, Cheers, no worries, thank mate. You. But yeah, Cheers. keep making the content, dude. See you soon. Thank you. See you guys.